Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to punch, chop, and kick your way through the greatest era of action movies. No year in particular, just all of them. Every year. All the great, all the great years of action, all of them. Except for anything after like 2015. Sorry, let me back up. Mad Max Fury Road was the end of action movies. They made that movie and they don't need to make another action movie after that. Ever again. No, never again. It's the greatest one ever created. End of action movies. Exactly. That's it. (laughs) Close it up. You're done. (laughs) Well, this week we are talking about the great, fantastic, amazing karate movie to kick off our karate season two theme of the greatest city, the greatest karate city in the United States. And also France. France. <laughs> no city. <laughs> the whole country, France. Oh, yeah, and Toronto. We... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, Toronto, too. But You know, Toronto and France, known for Kung Fu. <laughs> so our first movie selection for the season two of Go With The Heat Karate, Greatest Karate City, is No Retreat, No Surrender, which originally premiered on May 2nd, 1986. It is written by Keith Strandberg. He doesn't have a Wikipedia page, so sorry, he Keith. Never like, wrote you're, nothing you're, else. You're, you're a nobody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he actually is pretty involved in martial arts. Was actually stayed pretty involved in martial arts after this. That's a theme for a lot of people in this because it is directed by Corey Yuen. Now, Corey, this would catch you off guard because No Retreat, No Surrender is popular because it's considered to be like a quote-unquote trash movie. It's not very good. You have a lot of fun watching it because it's so bad, it's good, right? Yeah, it's very campy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, we're going to argue the fact that this is actually a good movie. It's campy, but it's also fun and good. But so I'll, <laughs> I'll do one more. Not just a good movie. I prefer No Retreat, No Surrender to Karate Kid. <gasps> <gasps> one or two. <laughs> One. <laughs> okay. okay. We're good. Just make sure we're not including the drums. Yeah. And you got to fight karate for her kid honor. Two is the best of karate. But I'll give you karate kid two. Karate kid two is, is a different story, but karate kid one. No, I prefer yeah. no retreat, no surrender. I agree with that. Okay. We can go on now. <laughs> now, Corey, Corey is actually a, a little bit of a Hollywood legend. Because he directed this movie, you think like, okay, we have a lot of these movies where these guys come in, they come out of nowhere, they direct stuff with some like Russian guy or something, and then you never see him again. <laughs> Not Corey Yuen. He is an action cinematographer, director, producer, co- like bike action sequence director, which I didn't even know that was something different. That they have separate action <laughs> sequence directors and they do regular directors and there's fight choreographers. Corey has been involved in all of that stuff. Name some of your favorite like action movies. He's probably been involved with it, including Lethal Weapon Four, the two thousand, the year two thousand X Men movie, a bunch of Jet Li movies like Romeo Must Die, Kiss the Dragon, Cradle to the Grave. Which wow. we got to come back to that movie. <laughs> There's lots of Jet Li with a rapper movies. <laughs> 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 We're gonna come back to those ones. And so Corey, so I make a big deal out of this guy because he's been in movies since like the early seventies. And it wasn't until 1986 that he got his first American directed movie, which is what No Retreat, No Surrender is. But then he went on from there to do a bunch of great stuff, too, in various facets of the film industry. He is. So what I'm saying is, is that if you want to make a karate movie, you got to involve Corey Yuen. Hands down, action, fight choreographer. I mean, the man found JCBD. He found him. Where was he before? <laughs> Apparently, during the filming, uh, JCVD's car was so tore up that at by the end of it, he would have to recruit people to help him push start it after they would finish filming. So <laughs> I just imagine they're filming, and they're and this is all filmed in LA, even though it's Seattle karate, it's all filmed in LA. I imagine he's like, "Hey, can, can I get you to come push my car?" And they come over, and he's like, "I know I have a funny accent, but it's not because I'm." I'm 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 from America, but my family they were born in France and they came to you. <laughs> I'm from Brussels, actually. But yeah, I guess this was like his second actual film. His first one was like Monaco Forever or something. Or... I'm, I'm gonna talk but about yeah, it a bunch, like his... but they get put too much rouge on him, so he's got that going for him in this movie. <laughs> he has rosy cheeks naturally. Don't be jealous of his hue. He just glows. <laughs> Before we get started, I'd like to stop here 
and talk about why we chose this movie individually. I know we talked in our episode where we picked out all of the movies, but specifically why we chose No Retreat, No Surrender. And I think this all goes back to how many times we talk about Seattle karate. And we're going to get to that scene. We're going to spend some <laughs> significant time with that scene. And that scene changed our lives, like karate wise. <laughs> I mean, I talk about it all the time. I was using it at my son's karate school, being like, Do you guys know what Seattle karate was? And they're like, No. I'm like, Well, then we're getting the hell out of here. Get out. No. Meanwhile, <laughs> Melissa's saying that this while wearing a, a dojo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Meanwhile, Melissa's saying that wearing a JCBD shirt where he's doing the splits on top of two sharks with lasers on their heads. Yes, I have that shirt and it's amazing. <laughs> and that was when they asked me who that yes. was. I was like, what? And this they're like, is oh, an incredible dojo. <laughs> yeah, what? I'm like, you don't know who this is? Oh, my God, we're out of here. So this is why we live in Phoenix, but did not choose a movie that includes <laughs> Phoenix karate. <laughs> Sorry, brothers. I won't say your name to <laughs> save you the hilarious. <laughs> but yeah, there was no way that we could ever pass on this movie because you know, look at what makes up a great karate movie. Got to have dojos fighting against each other. Ghosts. You got to have a ghost. Bruce Lee's got to be involved <laughs> somehow. Someone's got to break dance. Yeah. I mean, this. Mm -hmm. it, how else would you beat your best friend other than a dance off with a basketball in the middle of the street <laughs> while you're moving in? I mean, come on. Which I'm very jealous. I wish I could pull that off. Man, I could barely dribble a ball and, and like run. Like to do that while on a bike, oh my God, I would break my neck. RJ's got skills. JW fails. You did something I couldn't do. But apparently, <laughs> guys, so JW fails plays RJ. And he was also in Breaking 2 Electric Boogaloo. Oh uh, my God. God. <laughs> yes. But apparently he wanted to be in this movie. He wanted to get cast so bad that he lied to him and said that he could skateboard and dance and break dance. And so, but obviously he could. So they had to dub someone in for the dancing and for <laughs> skateboarding. We, we were like, I bet you he's not even really dancing. If he can't dance, how do you he's get not. an electric boogaloo? Yeah, what was he doing? Because he really wanted to be cast. And so he probably <laughs> lied, told him he could break dance. Because JW Fails is my save hero. The stance center, damn it. <laughs> because he couldn't actually <laughs> dance. Maybe he was just one of the guys who painted and did the background. So he was like also in Vendetta and a couple other things, but like he hasn't been in anything since 89. So JW Fails, wherever you are, I hope you're doing good. We want to hear uh, from you. Because you're like, certainly yeah. not on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe I dead. looked hard. We hope you're okay. I looked hard. We I hope checked. You're okay. I checked. Okay. He's not dead. Okay. <laughs> Get a real quick morgue check. He is not there. <laughs> they have never seen him. <laughs> there is so much to love about this movie. Campiness aside, if you love karate movies, you got to watch No Retreat, No Surrender. And I just want to to say that one of the reasons why I wanted to choose this movie is be and one of the reasons why I say I like it better than the first karate kid is because like, like legitly everyone that was cast that actually does martial arts actually legitly does martial arts. Like they're all black belts in karate and kickboxing and stuff like that. And that's what they did after the movie. I love Miyagi, but Bruce Lee as the sensei, come on. Yeah. And then you get a bad guy like, JCVD. The Karate Kid, yeah, you know, he fought the other kid. He didn't fight Jean-Claude Van Damme. Exactly. Like, like, come on. <laughs> I'm just saying. It, and it has a very Karate Kid feel to it because, you know, it's the whole family moves and then and, and, like, the whole fight at the end. I think the two movies are similar. I just think No Retreat, No Surrender is better. And, you know, No Retreat, No Surrender got a sequel that Corey Yuen directed. Mm -hmm. So I had several sequels. See though, if we can get our hands on it, including. And, and I guess Kurt McKinney, who played Jason, turned down that role because he didn't like where they were filming it. That's that's what I am. <laughs> well, I mean, there's so many sequels that King of the Kickboxers is an unofficial sequel. Yep, to it. exactly. So, like, hey, like, he could have never are. made it in that movie. <laughs> Billy Blanks is fucking impenetrable yeah he would have just broke him in half greatest. yeah there's no one as good what other man on a run can fire off six shots and get six hits <laughs> on that note well then let's go actually break down this movie and pick say 
uh, more why we love this movie and our favorite moments from this. All right, so let's set the scene. L.A. Karate at night. No traffic anywhere. It's a fucking lie. <laughs> yeah. What are you talking about? <laughs> Sherman Oaks. That's where it's at. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I love it's a mixed class of like old guys and yeah, kids, know. you know, so that way you know it's the advanced class. <laughs> well, I mean, our main character is only a red belt. Yeah. So. Which is, that's the whole part. Like, if you know anything about karate, you're like, so you're a red belt. Mm. <laughs> Did you see the 40 year old that had the red belt? Yeah, I felt it, so bad for him. <laughs> He had a sweet mustache, though. No, one of those guys had a thick mustache. <laughs> also, this uh, I just call into question L.A. Karate here. And I know we're going to talk more about L.A. Karate later, but they're like, this is a very choreographed scene where everyone's supposed to be doing the same moves at the same time. And there are kids just messing up all over the place and they're doing it with the wrong hand. So like some, everyone's doing it with the left, but one kid's doing it with his right. <laughs> and that was our son. Was he the kid that had Rodriguez on the back of his? Oh, um. calling him out. <laughs> Only one kid had his last name on the back of his shirt. Because he like, forgets, I couldn't figure okay? out why. <laughs> the class ends. Because, you know, that's what karate class, as we know, we've experienced. Karate class goes to, like, fucking 9 o'clock at night and shit. Yeah. Like, Never know. ends, okay? <laughs> the New York mob comes in. This is how you know this movie is going to be great. The New York mob comes in, and we find out later the reason why they're muscling local karate places is because they're fronts to their mob business. And they're setting up shops all over the country using karate dojos as the fronts to whatever they're doing on the back end. So they, I don't understand that part. Are they going to make the kids like sell dope or something or what? <laughs> <laughs> <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> Little Johnny, I'm sorry, but you can't get it's, your belt until you hey, go get this on the streets. <laughs> it's the 80s. This is how these crime lords got all their ninjas. <laughs> <laughs> Training Rodriguez to be a ninja. <laughs> also, if you haven't learned anything from Dolomite, that you know that if you're a badass, you got to group of badass karate people that travel with you everywhere. Uh, now, yeah. Now, only Dolomite, the man... Only though I can have a team full of foxy women that do it. Everyone else got set up for like red belt kids. Like <laughs> and JCVD. And I, lo <laughs> so, and, and I love this mobster. He's got, yeah, he's got JCVD in a white suit. And this other guy that literally looks like he just pulled out of a YMCA class. Yeah. Just some, like, there's some other schlub next to him. <laughs> So they pick the fight with Jason's dad, who's the karate teacher, uh, 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 who's the sensei at the dojo in L.A. And he picks the fight with them, and they start fighting, and he's kicking, like, the dude from the wise ass. <laughs> like, you can see him get nervous. Like, like, dude, my boss is watching. <laughs> but that's why they brought JCVD. He don't play by the rules. He's no, he does that badass <laughs> jump off the guy who's getting his ass on his back, and then he kicks him in the face and then he breaks his leg too and not just breaks his leg he ruins his leg for the rest of his life the dad is never the same it hits him in the brain too yeah, that's why such a jackass the rest of the movie you know? this scene him getting his leg broke in front of his kid turns his dad into kind of a puss for like most of the movie it does yes. yeah. I mean, so this, just, yeah let's be honest this is the v4 in the viagra commercial <laughs> It broke his spirit, okay? Next thing you know, he's going to be laying in bathtubs on the beach. <laughs> That's the <Alan. laughs> So the dad gets his ass whooped. And then after getting, like, just destroyed by JCVD, he's like, you know what? Ain't worth it. It's not worth staying here. We're going to pack up and move to the opposite of karate. That was the furthest away from karate I can think of. Seattle. Seattle. Okay, but Seattle. why did he have to, like, leave the, the state? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, I because I like guess he was involved in the class action lawsuit against JCVD <laughs> after he crippled that dude from Cyborg, and he actually testified. Against, oh, I'm sorry. You meant not in real life. I'm yeah. sorry. I mean, like not in real life. Like, why did he have to? Why, if you get your leg broke and you lose your dojo, do you also have to be like, I can't live here anymore? Yeah. Like yeah. your his wife know. has a job, his kids at school. Like, screw you guys. I like, can't live with the shame of that. I broke my leg in that dojo. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad he had to leave the state not just move to sacramento you know <laughs> like gotta go as far away he could have gone bakersfield karate 
I bet that karate crap. <laughs> all, all he knew, he was like, maybe I gotta get as far away from here as possible. Also, not leaving the West Coast. Yeah, no, There's a bunch of, of weird shit everywhere no, else. No, no, <laughs> 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 West Coast. <laughs> well, we do have our first guest star to talk about here because we and we mentioned JCVD a bunch already. That's because we love him. <laughs> and he's only gonna make another yes. couple appearances that are gonna happen in the rest of this movie. And we're gonna have lots of JCVD to talk about because eventually we're gonna talk about blood sport that's gonna be in this season. So there will be more mm-hmm. JCVD coming, but John, we know this is one of his first movies. It is, yeah. So, uh, by the way, yeah, Timothy D. Baker and Ron Pono both testified as character witnesses in JCVD's trial after he effed up that dude in the movie Cyborg. <laughs> <laughs> that's so, why I say he's um, too rough on set. Yeah, no, that's what that I read about that. They they yeah. all said that he was too rough that he punched a bunch of people. Like the the main character said that he punched him a bunch of times, like for real. Yeah, so the the guy that when he jumps up and supposedly kicks, he's supposed to kick him in the chest there in that scene. Instead, he kicks him in the head and then in the throat, and like that's <laughs> he actually testified in court and said, yeah, no, he kicked, he kept kicking me like he was terrible at at at, at Fake pulling kicking. his punches. Yeah. Well, that didn't hurt JC. That dude ended up getting like half a million dollars. Wow. Damn. Pussy. Um, <laughs> 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 this is his second credited movie. His first being Monaco Forever in 1984. But of course, it's Jean-Claude Van Damme. He's Time Cop, which they made like <laughs> 11 of those. So, I mean, like if you don't know Time Cop, uh, and then, like you said, we're going to see him in Bloodsport and the Kumate. He was also in Kickboxer, Double Impact with Dennis Rodman, Double Team, in which he has a clone. <laughs> Not the only time he ends up with a clone. So many Jean-Claude Van Damme movies. It's like you, you can't you can't not like at least one of them. Melissa, I'm going to give you an opportunity here because I'm going to tag JCVD and like everything that I do Don't, this week. I'm going to blush. <laughs> <laughs> Jean-Claude is out there listening. What do you want to say to your mans? I love you. No, <laughs> it's true. I mean, it's true. It is really That's true. how we got that shirt following him on Instagram. He's like, hey, you can buy this shirt a special edition. Yeah, you know, it, like- it was for charity. for Yeah, yeah, for animals because he's really into animals. There you go. He's got that going for him. He's really into animals. And yeah, and I bought that for charity, you know, just for charity. <laughs> Not because I wanted to wear JCVD on my body. I'm <laughs> I mean, what else can I say? I love him. I love his movies. I love him. He's funny. (laughs) He dances. But he was not the only guest star in the open here. We also got to meet Jason Stilwell, who's played by Kurt McKinney. Now, guys, Kurt McKinney, it it was a black belt in Taekwondo, and he was actually 21 at the time of the filming, believe it or not. (laughs) He was also an amateur kickboxer, and he was literally about to become a cop. When he got the audition, like he, he was turning in his application. Yeah. He started in this film. All right. So this is from his bio of his IMBD that he went on. He didn't want to be typecast. So he went on to star in General Hospital as Ned. <laughs> General Perfect. Hospital being a soap opera. Perfect. Uh, he also turned down a bunch of roles in like Kickboxer 7 because it was in South Africa. I'm, I, I don't know if that's for sure. <laughs> it might be kickboxer <laughs> five or 12, <laughs> but he also currently appears on the soap opera guiding light as Matt Reardon. He also made a badass TV movie called sworn to justice in 96, which we might have to revisit later. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what I love about this move that they do is that they pack up. They got to drive one last time past the front door of the dojo in their station wagon with the U-Haul trailer. They are clearly not bringing any of their furniture. I think the mom could have went a different route. I'm just saying. She's driving. Why would you drive? Was there traffic the other way or something? <laughs> Both of them are hanging out the window like little puppy dogs looking at their dojo like, oh. And then they, we have the long drive and we see the sign for Seattle and we see the space needle. We see them park and we see the houses. But like in reality, like they don't have Seattle money. They might have like Renton. Yeah, I've heard they got Tacoma, Tacoma money, maybe Tacoma. Spanaway. Like that's that's probably more. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, guys, like that's what I thought because like I'm watching this and I'm like, what? Where is this house? Is that like the U District? You know? I know. Thinking, I looked it like, up too. <laughs> this house is probably worth close to a million dollars now. Yes. <laughs> like, like no joke. 
and then over time, when you see the house, you're kind of looking around like, wait a minute. Like, just look at this. Like, then you realize, like, man, there's a lot of palm trees for being <laughs> yeah. a neighborhood in wait Seattle. A <laughs> wait a tick. You did not film this in Seattle, you liars. <laughs> this is L.A. I know what L.A. dry grass looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Jason already knows the house. So maybe they went there ahead of time. So he knows he's going to set up his gym in the garage. He can't wait. He goes running over there. And then starts setting up. He runs back out to grab some more stuff. Accidentally drops his basketball. And this is when we meet RJ. And him being able to ride a bike and dribble a basketball at the same time. The man's that got skills. So hard. Not dancing, though. No, <laughs> <laughs> the dribbling and riding the bike at the same time makes up for the unable to ride a skateboard or break dance. <laughs> He fake breakdance is pretty good, too, though. <laughs> but how many modes of transportation does he really need? Why did he need the bike ride and skateboard? <laughs> 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 Couldn't he just do one or the other? <laughs> Seriously, JW, if you're out there, get in contact with us. We want to know what's going on okay. with you. <laughs> <laughs> like so the only they... thing since 89 was something called California Dreamin' in 94. That um, The TV show? Yeah. Oh my God, That he was on that show. I love that show. <laughs> yeah, but I don't think it was a major character because he didn't show up in in like the main. Yeah, the no, main he's not group. one of the main characters because I know them all. And there's one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So our show was just visiting from Seattle, apparently. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sorry. That show was like about teenagers living like in, like, I don't know, they were in a band and they lived in California. They had was, a band and they were yeah. living on the beach. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it was right after, it was like, Supposed to be like a, a spin, not a spinoff, but very similar to like Saved by the Bell. I watch that every Saturday yeah, morning. It, <laughs> it was not Saved by the Bell. No, but it like that. It was like it was supposed to be like that. Listen, people, we're uh, talking about the wrong thing. We should know, be talking sorry, about sorry. that across the street. <laughs> watch that's watching RJ and Jason dribble a basketball and become instant friends. Is Scott who's so jealous? What's wrong with him? Why is he's he like, so jealous? Yeah, he's like, oh great, Bruce Lee. Here's I'm talking about that. But what I really want to talk about is the size of that ho ho he's got. <laughs> it's the size of a pizza. No, it's not a ho ho. It's a whole cake, <laughs> and he also has a box of ho hos. It's like a half a cake, and then I mean, okay, I just want to point out, I don't feel like this movie's fair to people. <laughs> you were kind of large. <laughs> yes, I kinda... It's kind of mean. <laughs> and we're not going to touch on that. But <laughs> So uh, Scott is played by Kent Leafham. Uh, oh, my God. He looks like a Kent. <laughs> poor Kent is no longer with us. He passed away at oh, the age it. of 46 <laughs> in 2008. <laughs> damn so, it. So hold your jokes, guys. <laughs> He is, he is, well, you could have told me that first. <laughs> <laughs> you could have led with that. <laughs> By the way, you can't, don't am. make fun of it. <laughs> His IMBD bio, actually, and this is straight out of it. Uh, I wrote it straight out of the bio because I, I, I really liked it. At the age of 16, fearing he was becoming agoraphobic, his mother insisted he join a club. Not being very smart, athletic, or crafty, <laughs> oh the God. drama club seemed perfect for him. That literally is in his bio in his IMDb. Did his mom write yeah. that? Um, <laughs> Damn. That's what uh -huh. sounds like something your mom would write about you, which is like, <laughs> you aren't good at anything. So, you got to go do something. <laughs> but it goes on to talk about how he loved it. It was the perfect fit for him. He was actually in four movies. So this is one of the four movies. The other three movies, he played T.C. Luke in Extreme Prejudice in 1987. He played Big Ed in Across the Tracks in 1990. That's a Brad Pitt movie. Oh, I love when that Brad movie. Brad Pitt was like eight, 17, 18. Yeah, it's all um, like cross-country runners. Oh, it, it, it's much worse than that. But <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> Yeah, no, I know what it's about. I'm not, I know everything. It's not, it was like a, it's, I read like the bio and I was special. like, ew. It was, it was like an after school special movie, practically. And he also played Mad Dog in Bikini Summer 91, which that is just awesome. That means that there's a chance that we've seen him in that because all those USA Up All Night movies. Yeah, we watched. we've seen Bikini yeah. Summer. <laughs> yes. I've seen I think, the, yeah, I've That's what I was going to say. I think we've all seen Bikini Summer at this point. <laughs> That is Scott or Kent Leafham. So, yeah, I thought, sorry, I thought that <laughs> I thought that IMBD was bio was great. 
that like it had to be like his mom or someone put that in there. <laughs> I, I forced him to join a club, and since he wasn't very sporty <laughs> or smart or good at anything else, <laughs> I don't know what Scott's deal is throughout this whole movie too, because. He in the next few scenes, he's because we get like JCVD in the very beginning, and then we don't get him until the end. Or Ivan, yeah. And then the same thing with Scott. We kind of get him in the beginning, and then he disappears for a long time, and then he never really comes back except for a few lines at the very end of the movie. So this movie has all these parts in it where there's like there should be more story here. Yeah, you need more to fill in. Randomly, I think we Mm -hmm. should just admit what his problem is. He's racist. He doesn't like RJ. Yeah, I'm serious. I think Uh that's what it is. Like, Actually, why did he have no, a vendetta so, against him? <laughs> I guess there was a scene that got cut out where RJ trips him at lunch at the high school. And that's why Scott doesn't like RJ. Well, but they been- cut it out of the movies, so then it makes no sense why he doesn't <laughs> like him. It seems like he's just a fat racist. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's all today. But they actually... <laughs> because there's the scene... There's a scene where you see him pressure washing those cans, and then he try he pressure washes RJ. Then RJ leads them on a chase and has that hilarious moment where the yes. construction workers are like, "Come you on, Betty! Like you can do it! Come on! <laughs> Come on!" <laughs> <laughs> oh God! You know that reminds me when I was working in California, I was working with another irrigation tech named Beto, and we're both on this tanning wall digging up a broken pipe. And across the street are all these high school kids. And one of the high school kids picks a flower and gives it to a girl. And me and him, me and Beto are laughing. And I turn and I pick up a rose bush that we had unplanted. <laughs> and I hand it to Beto. And we're laughing. And poor high school kids see us from across the road. They start laughing at the kid, giving, them the, giving the girl the flower. Oh, man. I felt bad, but it was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, Wilson, you have a similar story where a guy pulled up and winked at you at a stoplight, a bunch of construction guys lost him in a truck next to him. <laughs> he was walking across the crosswalk and he just like looked and stopped in the middle of the crosswalk, winked and, and did the like a finger gun at me. And then I looked next to me, it was like this the city of Tumwater guys and they're dying in their trucks of like laughing. <laughs> So I guess what we under, we understand these construction workers. They're like, yeah, dude, come on, man. come on, Daddy, you can do it. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. That's I guess that's my point. Is like, like us construction workers, like we don't really give a crap what's going on. Why he's chasing the other kids? Like, like no, come on, jump over the thing. <laughs> But yeah, that scene where he trips him at the school would have made much more sense yeah, when we I get to the a, burger place. Yeah. And then he sees RJ and he's like, oh, let's go get him. Make sure he can't escape so he can fight him. And it's like, dude, he's just like, what does he have against RJ? Well, like, they, they ask him. They're like, what do you have against RJ? He's like, I just don't like the guy. That could have been a good time to fill in. He tripped me at school and made me look stupid. <laughs> Which yeah, really isn't yeah. a reason to like try and kill him, but okay. <laughs> but, but it's better than just... Just not liking him because he's RJ. Exactly. Because <laughs> obviously there's one big difference between the two of them. <laughs> Jason just happens to show up because I I mean that's what we get the sense of, right? Is that RJ was waiting for yeah, Jason. RJ, to they show were gonna up. meet at the restaurant. He's able to rescue him, he's able to fight off Scott a little bit and then some of the other people, and then they say the line for the movie. They say, No retreat, no surrender, like back to back. And then they run off. <laughs> so they immediately surrender. <laughs> they immediately <laughs> retreat. <laughs> they, didn't really yes. me- they just came up with the slogan, right? They it, gotta find tune it. It just looked good on the t shirts. <laughs> yeah. What I don't understand with Scott is it just his racism against. RJ, is he like trying to build a gang? Because he's like, he has the whole thing in the burger place. Like, if you stay with me, you always get fed. And then no, he's like, always he's just... really dirty and like he spills stuff all over himself all the no, time. I think he's just a slob. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's. One I of don't those... know. His dad treats him like a stepchild, I guess. Yeah, you know, his dad's him. out there yelling at him. I think what it is with him is that he thinks like he has to. This is gonna get real deep for here, but he has to like buy everyone's like mm. to like him. So he's like, I bought you guys all this food. So you guys got to go help me get this RJ guy. He just wants to be like a big shot like that. And, he, you know, that's why he's a white belt. <laughs> we hear throughout the entire movie that Jason's dad is never happy about fighting. It's not the answer. You need to stop us. He's a horrible crutch actor. He's not able to, like, actually remember what leg he's supposed to be <laughs> limping on. <laughs> 
look what fighting got me. All that matters is that he's a big puss. That's all he's got to display in each scene. But we get to the first scene, and we get to the scene, the Seattle karate scene. We see in Reno, the sensei of the Seattle dojo is going to win some world it's the, it's title. It's the karate championship. Yeah. At home, Jason sees it and he turns to RJ and he's like, do you know where this guy's out? He's like, yeah, the gym's not that far from here. So, Because RJ just knows everything. Yeah, he's like, I know where it is. I'll take you right over there. That's what you get for knowing me. <laughs> RJ, all you uh-huh. do is ride your bike by a place. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> <laughs> so the next day, Jason and RJ go over. They get the whole welcome to Planet Fitness. <laughs> It's only 99 cents for the yeah. first month. You get the free trial. Uh-huh. And you can bring a friend. Yeah. Every karate place is like, hey, you want to do a free trial? They do that. And so they're like, yeah, he fills out a paper. And RJ's like, no, 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 I don't want to do this. I'm just here to support him. So they go off to the locker room. And here comes racist Scott. <laughs> He's also a member of Wham. <laughs> the Lost. <laughs> He's the third member of Wham with the hair he got and, and the clothes he wears. <laughs> So he goes up in, instigating crap, talking about how he starts telling him that he's Jason's talking smack about how much better L.A. karate is. <laughs> which, is th- which, I mean, obviously, they don't have a world championship. So this I mean. is so great because <laughs> Scott comes up to, I think his name is Dean. Dean he comes yeah. up to Dean and he tells him, hey, that guy, he's up to no good. He fights dirty. He did this to me, he points to his head. And this, and he blitz up his arm, and there's nothing there. there. And the other arm, too. And, the other arm, and there's nothing uh-huh. there. He's like, and also this. <laughs> yeah. And then Dean's like, whatever. He's like, it's like, whatever. You probably deserved it, you fat fuck. Yeah, he's <laughs> like, whatever. What did you do to deserve it? <laughs> and then Scott says, he also said Seattle karate sucks. And then Dean's, what? Yeah. He's like, what? <laughs> what? <Yeah>. <laughs> what do you by mean? By the way, <laughs> Dean's played by Dale Jacoby. After this movie, he was on the blue light team in Die Hard 2. Oh! <laughs> he was so also a boxer in Rocky 5. Damn. Oh my god. He was a judge in Kickboxer 2, The Road Back. So and he plays Brent Caldwell in Blood Match, which we oh almost my god. for this. <laughs> We have seen this guy a bunch. Yeah, then. yeah, we have. I like that he was on the blue light team. Like, doesn't have a name, but he was just in that special he airport. He was just there. Uh, <laughs> no, you remember the airport had their own like special tactics, like SWAT guys. Yeah, yeah. And remember they, oh, yeah. they all get shot up. He's one of the SWAT guys. Yes, he is. That gets shot up. I guess the other thing I should say is he is also a black belt and a bunch of crap because they they just listed a bunch of. It. He's like sixth degree black belt in this, fifth degree black belt in that. But the important yeah. thing is, is that if you want to learn from Dale Jacoby, he teaches classes at Lacoby Martial Arts Academy in Westlake Village, California. <laughs> at least he did back in 2012. So he's probably still <laughs> teaching there. So if you want classes from Dale Jacoby, <laughs> Lacoby Martial there. Arts Academy in Westlake Village, in California. He teaches kickboxing. Perfect. <laughs> Dean hears this that Jason. Jason is talking crap about Seattle karate, and which is, was a step too far. That was it. Everything too far. else was fine. I didn't but care s- that you picked on this fat kid. You, <laughs> you called out Seattle karate and said that LA karate is better. Listen here, fucko. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to annihilate you. Man, if only he knew he was going to end up in Westlake. <laughs> <laughs> so then he goes over to... Like the top guy in class, probably like a third degree black belt or something. And he's like telling him like, okay, this is what we're going to do. There's a guy here and I want you to give him a real good lesson. (laughs) (laughs) Frank is the only person that you can point to in this where you're like, yeah, he kicks ass all the time. Frank is a fucking badass. Yeah. And you can see how much he's holding it back when he just absolutely destroys Jason. (laughs) And then you do a quick Uh look up on Frank and you're like, oh, yeah, he will kick your ass. Yeah, for real. (laughs) Frank starts to feel real bad for Jason, but Dean keeps pushing him and tell him to keep destroying him. And then RJ eventually steps in, rescues Jason, and then they run off out the door. No one gives chase except for they just in this great shot from like up above. They look in. It's like a Dr. Evil shot with like, well, I guess LA karate isn't that good. Then everyone's like, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I also love how they no retreat and surrendered again. <laughs> For no retreat, no surrender, they do it a lot. 
<laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. Retreat! <laughs> Obviously, after you get your butt kicked, the best place to go is Bruce Lee's grave. Um, uh, yeah, and cry to him like, why didn't you help me, Bruce Lee? You're dead, but you should have helped me. <laughs> RJ's like, hey, you know, Hendrix is buried here, too, if you want to smoke a joint. <laughs> now we're going to get to meet Jason's girlfriend, which has a whole backstory that we don't get to see either. Like, they're dating. They're she, they're making out. She said something at the party like, oh, yeah, I met him last summer. Where'd she meet him at? <laughs> How much time yeah. has passed since the <laughs> moon? What the hell? <laughs> I don't know. Who gives people rabbits? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of sicko wraps, that... wraps up a rabbit in a box? Like, what if someone like shook it or something? <laughs> That's Listen, not a proper wait, gift. You I don't wanna... give your girlfriend a bunny. We are talking about the wrong thing here, though. <laughs> Whatever. His Kelly is great. Riley sits down and gets a phone. He has to step aside. He came back from the championship. He's got his trophy. He shows it to the dojo. All the people are there for, for the party. And then he has to run in, take a phone call, and it's a New York mob. Yeah, and they're saying like you have to be here in a half hour. Right? It's like I already told you, I'm turning on. It's like you got, you better be here in 30 minutes. We shouldn't be talking about any of that. We should be talking about the cock couch oh and the way that the Riley <laughs> house is decorated. It has cocks all over it. <laughs> I'm like, I want that couch. I told Dominic right away. I'm like, oh my god, I need to have that. <laughs> <laughs> where do you get that then they show when she opens the box for the bunny rabbit it's got these huge cushions on like their their kitchen table chairs how do you even sit <laughs> okay but i want a side note john saying like who gives a bunny to someone to their girlfriend my boyfriend in high school gave me a bunny <laughs> really oh <laughs> oh tell me that it, didn't end up in a pot somewhere it died like two weeks later he oh, gave me a bunny see? but he kept it at his house and it but so that I would have to go over there and like feed it and take care of it and stuff like that and, and it died oh. mysteriously. <laughs> I guess it <laughs> you got tired of you coming over all the time. It did, it died because he never told me like I don't actually know how it died. He said his dog got it and scared it, but it was I, just dead. I, I, <laughs> oh, no, I no. think I want to break up with her. Well, I better kill the bunny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like the most like manipulative relationship ever i got you this gift but you can only keep it in my house yeah it was like i had to keep it in his yes. house and he'd be like don't you yes. want to come over and feed the bunny <laughs> i'm serious yeah that's very that's very that's that's very uh, uh, creepy like like he grew up to be one of those guys with a van and all people puppies <laughs> and he named the bunny after himself <laughs> oh <laughs> wow Okay, he let's gave it talk, to me names, let's, and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> anyway. <wow. laughs> let's talk about Ian, Ian Riley, who's played by Ron Ponell. Ponell also holds a ninth degree black belt in the Chuck Norris American Tango so Sodo Karate System. He Sounds like one you can buy on TV. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, but no, I, I actually, he literally like trained under Chuck Norris. He also directed the... Two movies in 2008, one called Drifter TKD, and the other one called Thunder Kick, which sounds amazing. <laughs> uh, he also, he was also a stuntman in the movie Firecracker in 81. He currently teaches martial arts in Hawaii. So if you want to learn from Ron, you can go to <laughs> Hawaii. He works, he teaches martial arts there. <laughs> but he also testified, but he testified, unlike the other guy, in defense of JCVD in the trial for the onset injury to Jackson Rock Pitney. Pitney. Yeah, because that's a bunch of bull. Because he ain't no snitch. Yeah, he's no snitch. Because <laughs> he ain't no snitch, yeah. Back at home, Jason's dad has this meltdown over him getting in a fight again, which, I mean, I actually got kind of understand from the dad's perspective. Like, he's just out causing fights now. Like, he can stay away from these guys. It's possible. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but but yeah, I, I love it because he basically calls his dad out. He's basically like, just because you're a little bitch doesn't mean I have to <laughs> yeah, be. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, dad's like, I'll show you because Jason tries to act all tough. And then when he rips down his Bruce Lee poster, he's like, <laughs> he cries like a you? baby. And he runs off down the street. He cries like a baby. You know who I feel sorry for in all this? The wife, his mom. She comes home working her ass off. 
He's over, the dad's over there sulking because he ripped up things and he's got a hurt leg. Her son's ran away because he likes to do karate and he's a wimp. <laughs> Comes home from work like, oh my god, what is wrong with these two? So of course he goes straight to RJ and RJ's like, I know of an abandoned house that you can go stay in. But why can't he stay at Best RJ's house forever? <laughs> Or just like, listen, bro, I don't want you at my house. So I know this crack house around the corner here that's empty. Perfect for you. You can live there. And this was like, hands down, easily the best scene of the movie because they go to this abandoned house. He sets up all of his broken stuff that his dad destroyed Takes for the karate his stuff. Back together, pathetically. All his porno mags that he has. <laughs> that, karate uh, all, all the Bruce Lee porno mags that he's got. <laughs> They set it all up, and RJ is like, you're going to come stay at my place, you're going to go home. And he says, no, I'm going to go home. Because my dad's going to be freaking yeah. out. Yeah. So RJ leaves, and then Jason just passes out. He just falls asleep there. And then in the middle of the night, bright light <gasps> comes on. He looks up, and he's like, RJ, is that you? And out comes who they say his <laughs> name is different but in reality, we all know it's supposed to be Bruce Lee because he turns and looks because he hears him like say, like, you asked me to come. And he turns, looks over his shoulder at the Bruce Lee poster. And then the guy is like, no, wait, time out. Like, you don't like don't don't call me Bruce Lee. <laughs> call me. What does he call him? Uh, I have it oh. written down and I'm <sighs> missing it. He says to call him Lee Doggy. It means big brother Lee in Cantonese. So he's not he's still not so saying he he's him- not Bruce Lee. But, All right, they, but it gets even deeper, guys. It gets even deeper because Tae Jong Kim is the guy who's playing Bruce Lee, or Sensei Lee is how they leave him in the credits. <laughs> he also was a stand in for Bruce Lee in Game of Death and Game of Death 2, as well as playing Master Bruce in Fist of Death. So he's played Bruce Lee a number of times because he was Bruce Lee's stunt double okay, for so, the Game of Death movies. So. so so, but wait, but wait, but, but wait. So, I guess in these movies, you don't have to look like the person <laughs> who you're supposed to be the stunt double for? Well, I guess they assume since he was the stunt double, he played Bobby Lowe in Game of Death and Game of Death yeah. 2, he stepped in for him, that he could do it. And, and, like, Fist of Death is Jackie versus Bruce, which he plays Master Bruce, which I'm pretty sure is Jackie Chan versus Bruce Lee. But, but, uh, but he yeah, don't so, look like Bruce Lee. <laughs> I, I, hey, I'm, I'm just telling you the facts here. <laughs> let's let's continue to talk about the facts, though, because he comes walking out. He's just a ghost, right? Yeah. He's so a this ghost. is when this movie turns from Karate Kid to Fight Club <laughs> <laughs> in this moment, right? <laughs> also, yes. he says, call me Sensei Lee. Scott, uh, Jason, sorry, is convinced that he thinks it's Bruce Lee. Yeah. That's who he's supposed to look like. Yeah, he knows right? he's supposed to be Bruce Lee. And then there's this dubbing that they do on him to make it look like it's an old kung fu Bruce yes. Lee movie. Does it need to have mm-hmm. that stupid dubbing on well, it? Well, maybe that guy can't speak English. I, they, I, no, I, they literally had them film them sp- speaking different languages and then had him dub in the voice in English. For some some reason, I have no idea. (laughs) These are the most brilliant decisions made in this movie. That the ghost of Bruce Lee comes and they dub him like it's one of Bruce Lee's movies. And he has him teach karate fight club style where if you watch him as RJ does later in the movie, he's just fighting with himself. Even the moments where he's imagining those bags hanging. There's no bags. There's no bags. There's none none of that stuff is there. He's imagining all of it. But I can't be the only one that watches that part where he's like, where he starts to train with Bruce Lee. And I'm like, I just check out. That's boring. (laughs) I'm sorry. It's boring. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and it's like, because also because you get like five different montages of it because he basically trains for like 20 minutes of the movie is him <laughs> just training with a ghost for with sensei with a ghost yeah serious question though would you rather train with sensei lee or mr miyagi mr miyagi <laughs> sensei I lee i don't know yeah, Sensei Mr. Miyagi's Lee. got you washing his car. Sensei Lee's got you dodging bags. He's got you running. I don't know. I, I think I'm leaning Sensei Lee. And he doesn't actually exist. So, I mean. That's true. <laughs> that is true. So here's where we get to the real. So we have the best scene, which is when Sensei Lee comes. And then we have this whole awkward, really boring training Sorry, stuff that boring. happens. 
and the dubbing, it's just it's it's perfect. It's the best scene he in the movie. He pours out coke and pours in water and <laughs> he pours out the water, puts in the coke. <laughs> coke <and> then, <laughs> yeah. There's like some oh, yeah. so but serious question here, because then we're gonna get into the most confusing part of the movie. What is Jason training for? <laughs> there is nothing. <laughs> There's no like I'm I don't training know. because I want to fight this guy, or I'm training because I want to prove it to my dad that I'm a good fighter. It's just like I'm training because I got nothing else to do. <laughs> Has he even gone home yet? Is he still just? Like, I don't know. They never show him go home. Crack house. He doesn't. He doesn't talk to Kelly anymore because because of other thing that went down at the party. <laughs> he's he, clearly he's using drugs because he's not in karate anymore. He doesn't have time for his girlfriend. Uh, he talks to himself in a crack drugs. house. Yeah. <laughs> in this training montage, he's getting stronger. He goes from two-handed push-ups to one-handed push-ups to one-handed with two fingers. Also, he's doing it in elementary school, and the kids are like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> Why are you I wearing see the kids when they... on the swing in the background, <laughs> and his shorts just keep getting shorter. Exactly. Like, it's, they're so short, he's in danger territory. <laughs> obscene. Oh, guys. <laughs> Guys, when they film that scene, when he does the finger push-ups, they have the reason you can see the trees in the background is to cover up the strings that are holding him up. <laughs> so they're actually lifting him up and down with strings. That's why the kids are on the swings like, what the hell's going on over there? Oh, my God. Why does he have strings? Look at that wedgie. <laughs> Why can't he do finger push-ups? Now I'm severely disappointed. <laughs> it's all a lie. RJ I'm sorry. Did dance. I break here? <laughs> yeah. RJ can't dance. He can't do finger push-ups and short shorts. What the hell? Is it's a lie. All of it. Jason trains so hard for so long that he can outrun RJ on a little kid's bike. He can do crunches with <laughs> RJ sitting on his crotch. Eating a popsicle. <laughs> There's the three moments where we never forget this movie. Seattle Karate. Bruce Lee <laughs> and him doing those weird crunches with RJ sitting on his lap. Like he, with his headphones on, like he's eating the best popsicle he's ever had. He's like bopping around like, oh, yeah, this is a good popsicle on top of his best friend's crotch. I'm telling you, that is not legit training. <laughs> That's why he can't do finger push ups. Because he's too busy letting his friend eat popsicles on him. It can't just be the rest of the movie is montages. So we get a couple quick scenes. I mean, of almost is his but... dad being his dad being a pee at a bar, <laughs> and then <laughs> we get a dance contest. Now the dance contest is interesting. They all go to a club where apparently everyone has to dress up like Michael Jackson from Thriller. <laughs> is that like a required? The dance scene uh, is great oh, because. There's the, the two dancers when you walk in, they're really good. Yeah, they're and then good. RJ, or the person who dances for RJ, is really good too. Yeah, not the real RJ, but. <laughs> but it's all just a setup for more story that we don't have any other information on, which is like how he's not talking or seeing Kelly anymore. Then they finally set them up. And then also, in the meantime, Kelly forgot how to read lines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, they have the weir the weirdest DJ ever at that club. It's like some middle-aged man wearing a polo that's too small for him. <laughs> it looks like the mustache guy from the L.A. Karate Studio. Yeah, exactly. It's like, you don't belong here. What are you doing they at this follow club? them. Exactly. And then we get a quick scene because, remember, there are these guys, these mobsters in New York. Remember, that was part of the movie before. And they're like, yeah, we, are we good in Seattle? Yeah, we're good in Seattle. So, okay. Now back to the montage. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple scenes where Jason defends his dad. He beats up, shows off all his new talents. We still don't know why he's training. Why other than just to <laughs> show that he can kick people's ass. So by the way, that scene where he helps protect his dad outside the bar, one of the thugs, one of the guy's friends is the director of the movie. Oh, uh, really? Is, is the, is, I think it's, I think it's the Keith guy. Interesting. I'll have to go back. I need to pay closer attention to that scene then. So now we're finally to the where the story is actually coming back together. Riley is supposed to give up his dojo to the New York mob. He's refusing to do it. And they're going to have this like fight off yeah, to for see whoever who wins, wins yeah. gets to keep that dojo. And the main boss from the New York mob is going to fly out and actually witness this firsthand. And not just his capo and his muscle are going to be there, but that the actual mob boss is going to be there at the same time. And they stage this deathmatch fight. 
at the local YMCA or the Boys and Girls Club. The Boys and Girls Club. (laughs) We looked in in the credits. It says it was filmed at the Boys and Girls Club. (laughs) Nice. It's going to be the New York Marauders versus the Seattle Sidekicks. Yes. Now, if you go by name, New York already won. Yeah. Sidekicks. (laughs) Yeah, I know. God. What is with Seattle and poor sports team names? (laughs) Come on, guys. But the second in command for the New York mob steps in and says, you know what? We're not going to fight the What a twist. (laughs) You're only going to fight Ivan. Ivan is going to destroy you all. By the way, he's Russian. He says it. He's like, (laughs) straight from Russia. (laughs) Yeah, straight from Russia. He says it with a French accent. (laughs) (laughs) So JCVD finally makes another appearance. Looking fantastic. Jason shows up Guys. late with his dad and RJ and sees him, tries to warn the Seattle sidekicks that this guy is too much for you. You should back out now. He means trouble. They're like, now, nah, whatever. We and got it. They make jokes about him. They're like, oh, like we were for you. And he's like, fine, <laughs> whatever. When, Have fun. Let's just go back real quick. When JCVD, JCVD comes in, when Ivan comes in, he has a hype crew with him. <laughs> They're all wearing tucked in white shirts. <laughs> And they look like the Jets from West Side Story. <laughs> like that's his height. Th- those are his height men. Yeah. And we were talking about <laughs> what that. is we're going like, on. Yeah, we were talking about that, and we were like, "What is with them?" And also, some of them don't know what they're supposed to do, so they look really confused when they're walking in. They're like, "Okay, yeah, let's just do this." I don't know what I'm doing. The worst height men ever. <laughs> I don't care if your name is the sidekick Seattle. You better not lose to these guys. <laughs> Well, of course, Ivan comes in and destroys Dean. Oh, yeah. And then destroys Frank. Like, almost killed him. (laughs) Dude, he's just lighting these guys up. It's like nothing. Like, he's not even sweating. And then he does, we get to see the splits. We get to see him jump up on the ropes, and he does the splits on the middle rope. Like, anyone going to actually give me a challenge? And that's when Sensei Riley comes in thinking, okay, well, I'm the national karate champion. Yeah. I'm going to be able to defeat him. It is a little bit of a tougher fight. Yeah, no, he does. But Ivan's able to mix him up in the ropes, spin him around in the ropes, and beat him up real bad. He also beats up the referee with the wig. Oh, I almost <laughs> forgot about the referee in the wig. Oh my god, <laughs> he's the best part of the fight. Why does he have a wig? It's two different colors of hair. You can see his brown hair underneath it. They didn't even put the wig on right. Because he's probably like in the movie somewhere else. And they're like, listen, we need you to be someone else now. Okay, well, how do I do that? Well, put on this blonde wig that's made for a woman. (laughs) He's able to destroy Riley. But then Kelly tries to step in and get him to stop murdering her dad. No, brother. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no. That's not her dad. That's her that's brother. Her dad. That's her brother. Yes. I, mean, I thought that was her dad. No, it's her brother. <laughs> He's like, I love my little sister so much. I know. I thought it was creepy too. They where they were with each other, but that's the brother. <laughs> and she tried to hit Ivan in the head with a stool, and he grabbed it by the hair and lifts her off the ground. Yeah, and so that's when Jason's finally like, I have to step in on this. He comes flying in, and luckily he's been doing all that training. He's been so great. He trained Dude. with Bruce, with Sensei Lee all this time. Yeah. Not only has he been training all this time, and it just happens to work out that all that training paid off, but he even happened to wear this very fly red outfit <laughs> that makes him look like he's his own team. Like, who would have thought if he that he just happened to wear that outfit, and now he gets to fight? He took his windbreaker off, and it was like, oh, he all in red. <laughs> But what about Scott? Like he tried sequence. to help. He bit, he bit Ivan in the ankle. <laughs> <laughs> he did try. He tried. He did try. Fight ensues. It starts to get really dirty. Ivan starts to fight dirty, too. And, but thanks to the moment that Sensei Lee teaches him about when you think you have the upper hand, that you can do this backwards bicycle kick, he's able to do that and launch Ivan out of the ring, outside of it, and then the crowd e- explodes into celebration rush the ring hold them up above their head that luckily jason came to save us from what we don't know (laughs) to save seattle karate able to keep their dojo now but you forgot when they said no retreat no surrender you and rj rj's in the crowd like no retreat no surrender (laughs) 
Oh, and he God, should have just yeah. left, it's, right? It's, <laughs> he just gets out. It's fantastic. <laughs> he won the fight, and now the New York gangsters have to leave. Because obviously, <laughs> if you beat the mob in a karate tournament, they <laughs> cannot come back knows. and just murder you and take your dojo anyway. <laughs> Everyone like we've knows. never seen that movie before. Well, I mean, let's be honest. The brother, he's probably dead anyway. <laughs> or brain dead. They had him wrapped up in those ropes pretty tight and then they they like took him off in a stretcher. But no one talks about that. <laughs> guys, guys, Riley's going to have to move out of state. Exactly. He's going to have to move to like Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's gonna move to West Lake California. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why hey, Dean kickboxing. left. That's why Dean left because he was like embarrassed. I gotta go. <laughs> he's gotta go do Tampa, Tampa, Florida karate. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I did forgot to mention the note you surrender because I have a note written down here that says thanks, RJ. I won't reach re or surrender. <laughs> <laughs> He's like getting his ass kicked, basically. He's like, no retreat, no surrender. The dad's like, yeah, I don't know what's going on. I, s- <laughs> I still don't see how this victory stops anything that is going on with this dojo. Nothing. Like, or the other dojos they've already taken over. <laughs> they still have the yeah. rest of the country. Like damn, that they, Seattle. They, we like don't have that one. Still a pee. Like like <laughs> nothing, nothing has changed. He's got Kelly though. I mean, she can't she can't break up with him now. Yeah, he saved your brother. From I, me. I think <laughs> I think the one important thing that we have to recognize though is that L.A. Karate wasn't good enough to John Claude Van Damme. No, but once he learned Seattle Karate from Sensei Lee. He was able to defeat John Claude Van Damme, mm-hmm. and since John Claude Van Damme won the Kumate by association, <laughs> then that means that Jason Stilwell or Kurt McKinney better than the champions of the Kumate. Uh, <laughs> it's the Kumate, and it's not true. Kumate. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Frank Dukes would kick your ass. <laughs> He also the I just saw Frank you. Dukes get bicycle kicked out of a ring by Seattle Karate. I'm just saying. Frank Dukes can also outdo you at everything, okay? Have you ever read, read that man's biography? He like, makes up yes. things that don't even... <laughs> His Wikipedia is like 300 pages exactly. long. And he it wrote it ridiculous. himself, okay? We all know that Jean-Claude Van Damme kicked every one of their asses. That's why they're mad, and that's why they were like, Ow, he hurt me! <laughs> Because in real life, he kicked their asses, and then, and then he had them push his car. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I broke your leg. We'll come push my car out of the parking lot because it don't start. <laughs> Maybe that's why they sued him. <laughs> All right. Well, before we get to our final thoughts on this movie and explain why we love it, so you can tell why we love this movie, <laughs> let's go take a look at the music of this because I think it's going to be special. Seeing the credits <laughs> at the end of the movie. There's a very special person in, in <laughs> music. Let's go break this one down. All right, John. Music's up. And, you know, at the be- first time I ever watched this movie, I didn't even realize that it had music in it. And then watching it a second time, we learned that not only was there music, but it's hype music for our own son. Oh, my God. Yeah, he's like, oh, yeah, I put this on my playlist and I listen to it all the time. Right. Like, what? So apparently oh, this way. music is on Spotify. Yeah, we were like, wow. Awesome. <laughs> what do you got for all us right. this week? Well, guys, let me just jump right into it. So there's one thing that almost every song has in common and that it was either written or the music was done and written by Frank Harris. So all of the songs were sung by other people, but Frank Harris wrote all of them and did the music for some of them, except for one song, but we'll get to that one song in a minute. All right, so the songs were Hold On to the Vision, Ask Me to Stay, A Bottle and a Song, (laughs) and Close to You. The names, they're great. All right. They were all sung by different people. Let's first let's talk about who sang them. Close to You was sang by MJ Lalo. They are a jazz artist and actually released an album in 2002 called Voices 
from the night sky. It actually did more music. That's the only thing I could find on them. A bottle and a song was sung by Mary Reynolds. I couldn't find much on Mary Reynolds. Same with Ask Me to Stay by Kelly Styles was sung by Kelly Styles. And so I couldn't find much there. But Hold On to the Vision was sung by Kevin Chalfont. And he's actually kind of a big name singer songwriter. And he was also in the band Storm with a bunch of the members of Journey. And really? he toured as the lead singer of the Alan Parsons Live Project, which is, I guess, something they did after the Alan Parsons Project. <laughs> <laughs> it was his second project. He actually is kind of a name. But what is hidden in this is that the guitarist on Hold On to the Vision was none other than Joe frickin' Satriani. No oh my God. shit. Yes. How did they get Out that? Out of all of the nobodies in the music, Joe Satriani sitting there playing this song for, for No Retreat, No Surrender. How? How did they pull that? <sighs> I have no idea. By the, if you have never heard of Joe Satriani, just Google him. He's the biggest name in guitar since Jimi Hendrix. That's how epic Joe Satriani is. He he still fills stadiums when he tours. Legit musicians love him. Yeah, I All can't right. believe that. That caught me off guard. So then I started looking more about Frank Harris. And Frank Harris, he composed this soundtrack, and he composed the music for the movie... Not all parents are straight. Wow. And that is exactly about exactly what you think it's about. Wow. Um, in 1988? It's about kids who, yeah. It's about kids who grew up in families of uh, same sex LGBT. Otherwise, Frank Harris pretty much kind of hard to find unless you go to frankharrismusic.com. <laughs> so, uh, by the way, go to frankharrismusic.com. He has a new release out called Echoes with Maria Marquez on vocals. Frank Harris, he does kind of uh, a little bit jazz, but a little bit of world kind of music. He, has, he also has a CD of yo yoga music as well as a CD of world music. Uh, Dominic, you're going to love this. That new release, the LP of Echoes, they released it on vinyl from Strange Love Record. <laughs> nice. I love outside that he's still making his, music. Yeah. Dude, outside of his music for the last 35 years, he has run his, his own production company called Third Wave Productions. Third Wave Productions, aside from his own music, has also, he has also edited and composed some uh, live blues concerts and done a number of TV commercials. And if you go to frankharrismusic.com, <laughs> you can see the TV commercials he posted up, each of the commercials that he's done music for. You can see he's got a Capital One commercial, a Dos Equis commercial, a Rolling Rock commercial, Jenny Craig, a Chevron. I thought that was pretty cool. So <laughs> go to frankharrismusic.com and check out his new release called Echoes. You can get it on Spotify. Uh, Maria Margos on vocals. Go so, stream it, people. And, go stream that music. Hell yeah. And by the way, you can buy the soundtrack for this movie on that website. <laughs> nice. That is available. <laughs> that is a big part of that website. So uh, the last <laughs> song... On the soundtrack is Stand On Your Own, which words and music were written by Paul Gilgreath and performed by Joe Toronto. Now, I couldn't find much on Joe. Not sure. Don't think he did much after this. But Paul Gilgreath. So, weird deal. Paul Gilgreath was, kind of, was actually listed as a producer on No Retreat. And it was almost like he split up the score duties with Frank Harris. So, mm. like... Frank Harris did most of the soundtrack, and then Paul did one song, and then he also did, Paul did the music for the trailer, and the music, uh, and the, like, some of the stuff for, like, the credits, and so it's like they split up the duties, almost. And he's a producer and composer, and also still a jazz artist. He actually has his own CD out, jazz. So, all of them, uh, jazz artists, but... If you want to check out some new world music, check out frankharrismusic.com. <laughs> and that is your music. Nice. I knew I had high hopes for Frank Harris. I was not let down. <laughs> yeah. You knew once you knew your son had it on his playlist. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, let's go give our final thoughts on No Retreat, No Surrender. I think we've been waiting years to talk about this movie. So let's give our final thoughts. 
All right, I'm going to kick off. I love this movie. I'm not going to hide it in any way that I love this movie. And this is what I think makes the quote unquote trash film genre. And people love to find there's like this growing trend of people who love to find movies so bad that they're good. What they miss in those, and we made a lot of fun of this movie, but what I love about this movie is that it is a lot of action. The action is actually really good. Yes. You can tell that Corey Yuen, the director, that yeah. he does a lot of fight planning, a lot of fight directing, a lot of action directing, because the fight scenes are really, really good. And it turns out there's a director's cut that makes the story make more sense. <laughs> <laughs> it would just release the, release the Corey cut. <laughs> and we yeah. will, well, the story will make more sense. But what I love about this era of karate movies and this is one and the no retreat, no surrender tagline with like the name of the movie that they say it in the movie, the tagline that, that they say. And then RJ is that all these movies are so optimistic. Mm -hmm. They're all about like treating people right and doing the right thing and helping your community. And it's going to come up in Miami connection too. Oh my God. That, and all these movies are so great and no retreat, no surrender is totally one of those movies, which is like do what's right for your community and take care of other people and have a good attitude and everything is just going to work out. And I love that stuff about like the mid eighties karate movie and no retreat, no surrender has all of that stuff. And also the ghost of Bruce Lee. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's just a bonus. <laughs> this movie is like other ones, which is it doesn't take itself so seriously. It's not like everything is going to come crashing and burning if they lose. And that's one of the things, the problems with modern action movies is that if they don't rescue this, it's going to destroy all of Chicago. Yeah. This the is whole just like world. their mm -hmm. one little dojo and it could whatever it impacts their little community. So the stakes aren't like crazy high. So they're allowed to have a little bit of fun. We're allowed to have Fatty Scott <laughs> causing <laughs> problems with food all over his face. Like, it's okay to have a little bit of fun, too. John, what are your final thoughts? No, I totally agree with you. And this is like, when we first watched this, we watched this for our own movie night that we did before the podcast, you know, that uh, we did as a family. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the things that made me, that really endeared me to some of the really bad movies was this one because of how much fun it was. And I joked about it being better than Karate Kid, but I, I feel the same way watching this movie that I feel watching Karate Kid and some of those older movies that I grew up watching as a kid. Because you're right, it's full of positivity and it's it's legitimately good fight scenes and maybe the plot's a little silly, but it's a fun movie. It's always been a fun movie. And we get to have fun with it now because we get to make fun of the Bruce Lee, the ghost of Bruce Lee with it and everything. What really makes it for me, too, is to then bring it into the podcast here and do a little bit deeper dive and learn a little bit more about how RJ couldn't break dance or skateboard, <laughs> but somehow got cast in this and in Electric Boogaloo, too. Um, <laughs> which is amazing considering, but like in learning stuff like, like they were legitly like every single one of the karate students were legit martial artists. Most of them, some of them were amateur kickboxers and fought in MMA and stuff. Like, like, like there were some legit dudes. It is a legit karate movie. It has its chops. And even as silly as it is, it really stands up from the karate aspect, from just the fun aspect. And then you, John claude Van Damme plays the bad guy. The only other time I've ever seen John claude Van Damme play a villain was in The Expendables, you know? Uh, that's true. Yeah, he doesn't um, play a villain, yeah. That alone is just fun because you, you never got that throughout his entire career. His second movie ever, he plays the bad guy, not again, until, you know, five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I love about this movie. I think Seattle Karate rocks, especially since my nephew started in Seattle Karate. <laughs> so, <laughs> Melissa, what are your final thoughts? Well, I can't deny what everybody has said. It's it's an amazing movie. It's it was my movie pick for movie night. And then we got to pick it. We got to pick our favorite of the season. And I picked it again because I love that movie. <laughs> Everything about it is fantastic. It's, it's, it's I love. And what I love about it is to like to echo what you guys have said, that they put those people in that are actual like real martial artists and stuff like that. And they're not like they're not trained actors. OK, <laughs> but yeah. they are. But that's not what they cared about. They wanted it to be like accurate fighting scenes. And they did that. And now that you know that it was directed by somebody who 
actually like work with the the legends of karate, then it makes sense. Obviously, I'm never going to turn down a movie with JCVD, even if he's a bad guy who wears too much rouge. <laughs> <laughs> he still looked good to me. <laughs> <laughs> and that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love to hear from you. Remember, this is the greatest karate city. So we want to hear from you what you think about Seattle karate. Email us, GoWithTheHeat at gmail.com. Get us on Twitter at go with the heat. Go to the website, GoWithTheHeat.com. You find all the other ways to contact us. Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr. Christian <laughs> Mark, we might have a Tumblr still. I don't know. <laughs> and if you see... And if you see JW fails, let him know we're looking for him, buddy. <laughs> Please, we email just want to make sure you're okay. Yeah, we want, yeah, we want yeah, to know you're we all right. Hear from you. If you reach out to us, we would love to interview you on the show to talk to you about this movie, being in California, dreaming, what you've been up to, Electric like, Boogaloo. Yeah, like we, what? What's Chevy do like? Oh Can you break dance now? <laughs> <laughs> we want to talk to you, bro. Reach out to us. Go with the heat at gmail be sure to check out that website, go to heat.com and find all the ways to contact us, all the ways to subscribe. We would also like you to go to your podcast, your platform of choice, Google, iTunes, Radio Public. There's, I seriously, I go look at our dashboard. There's a thousand different places you can listen to podcasts now. Stitcher, o- Overcast, I, I don't know. There's a lot of them. I want you to go to those, to your podcast, your platform of choice and leave us a review. Just leave us five stars. Just, just do it. Yeah, just do it. It's fine. I didn't tell you to do that. Which just leave us five stars. <laughs> but don't write a review. <laughs> no one ever reads the reviews. Instead of writing a review, we want you to write what it would be like when RJ is in Break into Electric Boogaloo. And he can't dance. <laughs> and the stories that he's talking about his karate days in Electric <laughs> Bo- Boogaloo. Tell us what happens, how Electric Boogaloo is a sequel to No Retreat, No Surrender. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals.